Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the cochlea. There was some request for a video like this because today in class we talked about hearing and although with say vision you can kind of picture the, the retina, sheet of neural lining, photoreceptors, bipolar cells, ganglion cells, that's kind of okay. The cochlea is a lot harder to understand. So I've drawn a very simple schematic. This is not necessarily drawn to scale. This is just to illustrate a point. Okay, let's talk, let's talk through this once again. For the record, it is cochlea, not cochlea. Ear, auditory canal, sound comes in, gets channeled through the auditory canal in the ear, and then it hits the first structure in the ear. And that first structure is the tympanic membrane. And the tympanic membrane, as we talked about, that starts to vibrate. Connected to the tympanic membrane are the three ossicles drawn completely out of proportion. It, I'm just giving you an impression, right? Hammer, anvil, ending up in the stirrups. Now that's where things get interesting, because the stirrups connect to a membrane on the cochlea. Now remember that, 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 that cochlea looks like the house of a snail, right? But what I've done here to make it a little clearer is I've uncoiled that a little bit. You can do that. The cochlea is the size of a pea, and if you dissect a cadaver, you can take out the cochlea, and you can uncoil that thing. That's a little bit uncoiled, because usually, of course, this would fold in more. Now, sound. Tympanic membrane, hammer to anvil to stirrups, the three ossicles. That part's easy. Stirrups, as I said, connect to the oval window. The oval window is a membrane in the cochlea. The cochlea is made out of pretty hard material. That'll come in useful later. That's why we call this whole structure the bony labyrinth. Hard. But a membrane is soft. So those stirrups push in and out onto that oval window, that membrane right there. Now what do you see? You see that there's a tunnel here, right? To which that oval window connects. It closes off that tunnel. Just think of it, like a, a tunnel you can drive through with a car. You could put a gate in front of it, right? That's it. Well, that gate, that would be the oval membrane. That's not filled with air. That's filled with a liquid. Now, in reality, there are three tunnels. Three tunnels. But we're going to pretend there's just two tunnels in the cochlea for this course. If you want to learn more, you have to take sensation and perception with me and I'll explain it all. But for now, two tunnels. Okay, because that membrane is moving, that liquid that's right behind it in that tunnel is also going to move, right? Of course. Think of a bathtub filled with water. You smack your hand in the water, water's going to move. You're going to get waves. Now this is one tunnel, but then this is another tunnel. Huh. And those two tunnels, they can communicate. All the way at the end, you see that here. You see that if you follow along, one tunnel turns into the other tunnel. Completely useless, but that part, little opening at the apex, the tip of the cochlea where those two tunnels communicate is called the helicotrema. Completely useless to even name that, but, but it has a name, helicotrema. I don't have to know that for the test. Now I want you to understand what happens. What's the flow of this liquid here? It's going to do this. Stirrups onto the oval window create a wavy pattern, makes the liquid move. And the liquid is going to stream in this direction. There, there, uh, sorry for the, you know, there, and then it hits that helicotrema. That's the point where these two tunnels connect. Continues moving, liquid goes there, liquid goes there, liquid goes there. Now here's a fun property about liquids. You can't compress a liquid. If you could compress a liquid and you wanted to carry a liter of water on a hike, you'd be able to compress it to something this size, but you can't. That's not how liquid works. You can do that with a gas, you can't do it with a liquid. So that liquid has to go somewhere. 
But as I said, it can't really go anywhere. Because at this point, it hits a dead end. Now, if you've ever played with a balloon filled with water as a kid, you know what happens when you squeeze it. It bulges out, right? But the cochlea can't do that because of the bony labyrinth. It's hard. It's a hard material. But there is another membrane called the round window, and that's right there. So when that wave has hit this point, that membrane bulges out. None of this was covered today. I'm just giving you a bit more detail in hopes that it will make more sense to you what's really going on in the cochlea. Because if you can really build up this image in your brain, you'll understand it a lot better. Okay? Tympanic membrane, ossicles, hammer, anvil, stirrups, stirrups in and out, oval window, liquid moves, through the helicotrema, one tunnel turns into the next tunnel, round window. Well, that's the basis of the story. But now, how do you hear? Well, you hear because these two tunnels are separated by a partition. And we're going to keep it really simple. This thing, in between these two tunnels, again, in reality, there's a third tunnel. Let's not complicate it. This thing is the basilar membrane, okay? It's right there. Basilar membrane. Now think about what happens. That is literally, it's a partition between two fluid-filled tunnels. So if you get waves here, and these waves are just doing what waves do, waving, that basilar membrane is also going to move, right? So the basilar membrane is doing that. It goes up, down, up, down, up, down, etc. Remember what lines the basilar membrane all the way down, and remember what the cochlea does. Coils up, right? So throughout all those coils, I want to say two and a half coils, but I could, I would have to double check that. Throughout those coils, you have basal membrane, and that basal membrane is studded with hair cells. Now, there are inner and outer hair cells, but we're not going to care about the outer hair cells that much. The inner hair cells, okay? You hear all those hair cells. It's actually quite a complicated thing they do but they have tufts of hair sticking out of them, hence hair cells, and let's just say for this course, they move. In reality, there's another membrane, it's kind of like a shearing motion, but we're just gonna keep it simple. The basilar membrane makes that wavy motion, and those hair cells move along. And if they are displaced in one direction, they fire action potentials, and if they are displaced in the other direction, they don't. That's the signal, on, off, on, off, on, off. Simple. All the axons of the hair cells are connected. They bundle up. Well, they're not connected to each other. I mean they bundle up. That's what I would try to say. So you have a bundle of axon fibers, and that leaves the cochlea. That makes up half of the vestibulocochlear nerve. That's a cranial nerve. It doesn't matter. A nerve that allows your brain to interact with your senses and with parts of your face and such. The other half, from the vestibulocochlear nerve, comes from there. That's really badly drawn. So fortunately I have a pocket cochlea. There you go. You have a cochlea, right? Coming out of it, that yellow thing, is the vestibulocochlear nerve. That's the auditory branch of the vestibulocochlear nerve. The other half comes out of these three tunnels. That's your vestibular system. I'm just going to give you a little bit more information just because this may interest you. These tunnels have different orientations, and they allow for vestibulation. That's kind of the final sense we don't really cover. That allows you to know the orientation of your head, right? That gives you your sense of balance. Those are your balance organs. Fluid-filled tunnels. You can understand that because we've just gone over other fluid-filled tunnels. This works very much like that. Depending on how that fluid runs, right, you have pitch, Roll and yaw, pitch, uh, I want to say pitch, yaw, and roll, but I probably got one wrong because I always forget which is which, but those three motions are coded by fluid running through those tunnels. But that's not even on the test. That auditory branch of the vestibulocochlear nerve, that provides input to your brain. 
And that's what we talked about in class, cochlear nucleus, uh, uh, superior olivary nucleus, um, inferior colliculi. But for our intents and purposes, hair cells in the basal membrane, two thalamus, medial geniculate nucleus, to the primary auditory cortex. That's how simple we're going to keep it. Okay, that was the first part. Second part, I think I can make a lot shorter. What about this place coding and frequency coding? How does your brain know you're listening to high or low pitch sounds? Well, because of two things. First, place. This basal membrane actually has a weird shape. It actually tapers out. I'm exaggerating here, okay? This we call the base. And this we call the apex. The base is there, and the apex is there, close to the helicotrema. And you can see it tapers out. Now, what do we know? We know that this part, this is, again, a bit more information that you need to know, but I hope that if I give you this extra information, it'll make more sense to you. The base is stiff. Think of a rope, as I said in class. If you whip that, this part won't move that much. But the part all the way at the end will make that big whipping, snapping motion. This part of the, of the um, basal membrane doesn't move that much. Move that much. This responds to very high frequencies. I always like to think, because it's so stiff, it needs really high frequencies to be made to move. The apex responds best to low frequencies. It's wider and it's softer. It's floppier, whereas the base is much stiffer. High frequency, low frequency. Now what does your brain need to do? Well, if there's mainly stimulation, remember, a wave-like pattern. If that wave running across this peaks there, and the brain's going to say that's about a medium tone. If it peaks here, the brain's going to say, oh, that's a high tone. And finally, it's going to be super clear, right? Three things superimposed. If it peaks there, the brain's going to say, well, that must be a low tone that you're listening to. And of course, it could be anything in between. That's place coding. You just look at the place on the basal membrane where the wave peaks. But then there's frequency coding. And frequency coding, I think, is simpler to understand. All that means is, how many action potentials does the auditory nerve fire? And that works to a degree. So for example, a 10 hertz sound, 10 cycles per second, well then the auditory nerve would fire 10 times per second. A 100 hertz sound, in other words, 100 sound cycles per second, auditory nerve would fire 100 times per second. That's not very difficult, is it? Problem is, that only works up to about 6,000 action potentials per second. Beyond that, it's just not, it's not possible. In other words, the auditory nerve cannot fire that quickly, cannot fire 20,000 times per second for a 20,000 hertz sound. It's not possible. And that's why you need both of these theories. So your brain can rely, up to a degree, on frequency. Hey, 100 action potentials per second, 100 hertz sound, pretty low frequency, low pitch. 5,000, let's make it a little less extreme, 2,500, 3,000 action potentials per second, well, it's slowly getting up there a little bit, right? And theoretically, 20,000 action potentials per second, a high frequency sound, except that's physically impossible. Those, those fibers cannot fire that many action potentials. So at that point, at that tipping point, we can no longer fire as many action potentials as there are cycles per second in that sound. Well, then the brain has to resort to, well, now I need to figure out where I see a peak. And both of that information is used. Where does the wave peak on the basal membrane? Base, high frequency. Apex, low frequency. Or, if it's not too high frequency a sound, how many action potentials are fired? 50? 50 hertz sound. Easy. That's how that works. This little thing, 
is the eustachian tube. That was useless because we will not discuss that any further. But just so you, you know, that's the eustachian tube. All right. I hope this has clarified a little bit. Let me know what you think. Let me know if anything remains unclear. Okay? Good luck!